You're listening to Trek FM. Want to join in the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners discussion group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field and we look forward to seeing you there. This is Steve Sansweet of Rancho Obi-Wan and you're listening to the 602 Club. Hello and welcome to Trek FM's local watering hole, the 602 Club, coming at you live from, well, uh, Black Spire Outposts uh, here right at the edge of wild space and the unknown regions. So excited to be here and I'm not the only one here. So glad to have back with me. It's been a long time since I've had this gentleman here uh, at the cantina, but Bruce Gibson, it is great to have you back in the seat. Thank you for having me back. I want some blue milk while I'm here in the 602 Club because it tastes really good. That rice and soy milk mixed together. Mm, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I hear that blue milk is better than green milk. So I didn't try green milk yet because I just like the visual of the green milk that I saw in the last Jedi is not very appealing to me. I like more. <laughs> That's of the true. It's not. Baru. Mm. You didn't served. want it running down your beard. No. And... <laughs> I need to grow okay. the beard out just a little more to do that. That's true. <laughs> Cause you don't look enough like a hobo yet no. to, to make that effective. So, uh, well, John Mills, uh, is, is also here, which, and he's, he hasn't been here in a while either. And mm. John, you just got back, uh, from visiting, uh, everywhere around Black Spire Outpost, you've been wandering around all day. Yes, and I, and I can say that that green milk, it's okay if you miss it. Blue milk is the one to go for. Bruce, you didn't miss anything. That's what I've heard. Yeah, I mean it's okay, it's okay, but I, I would have rather, in retrospect, had two blue milks instead of a blue and a green. So, what are you gonna do? Ronto wraps are great though. And uh, were there any uh, beverages for adults that you would recommend from a Black Spire Outpost? Why, well? yes. Uh, the Coruscant Cooler is uh, very refreshing. Very oh, that refreshing. sounds delicious, yeah. man. I wish we had a round. Can we get a round of those, Ruby? That would be great. <laughs> um, well, we're really excited to be here tonight because um, we've had a brand new uh, Star Wars book released. And, and actually... Throughout the end of the year here, we're going to have a few, especially as we're looking towards the rise of Skywalker and, and a lot that's been coming out. But this book honestly has nothing to do with that. This is Thrawn Treason, and Zahn has wrapped up his trilogy here for, well, I, I would say this portion of Thrawn in this portion of the uh, timeline, you know? So, um, because he had a very narrow gap <laughs> in uh, season four of where he could tell this story. So we're going to talk about that tonight, but a quick reminder, um, you know, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts here. Uh, Track FM is all over the place, uh, and so is the 602 Club. Uh, we would really appreciate it is if you did a few things. One, make sure you're subscribed wherever you get uh, your podcast to the 602 Club. That way, each episode comes to you each and every week. Uh, also, hit us up on the star rating and review Help people find the show. Uh, iTunes has been kind of reworking the categories now and making them even better for people to be able to find uh, episodes of shows that they like and what they're interested in. Um, so more star rating and some reviews will actually help more people find the show. Uh, you can also get us, like I said, wherever you get your podcasts. We're on Twitter at Track FM. We're on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Track FM. As you heard in the promo, we got the listeners only discussion group there on uh, Facebook called the Babel Conference. Uh, to get there, just type Babel into the search field. Or if you're on the website at track.fm, any of the show pages, there's a button that says discussion. That'll lead you there. And maybe you'd like to send us an email. Uh, you can always hit us up there at track.fm slash contact, choose a show, choose the 602 Club, and then that would come to Christy and I. So, guys, I wanted to. First, I, this isn't even on the outline, but I, I, I've got to ask you what you think about the idea of of just this book in general and where it is placed. The fact that you know Zahn has about a week or so to tell a story with Thrawn in between that time period where he leaves in Rebels, where he was 
He thought he was being called to Coruscant, but now we know the true story. He wasn't going to Coruscant. He was being summoned by Tarkin for this meeting. Um, how do you did it work for you guys? Uh, the the placement of the story. Yeah, I mean, it worked for me because I love filling in gaps into any series. So, you know, we have that week in Rebels, and so why not fill in that gap as to what actually happened with Thrawn? Not that I necessarily. Not that I necessarily wondered about it all that much, but I mean, this definitely worked in that period for me. Um, I actually kind of like that it's condensed to a week, too. That's something that's not playing over the course of several months. So it keeps the story and the action kind of compact into that period. Yeah, and, and I think that as an added bonus, just to add on to what Bruce is saying, um, his his disappearance, if you will, during that moment in Rebels could you know, if you wanted to, you could sort of be like, oh, well, okay, that's convenient that he was gone. But like with this, it gives a purpose and a real meaning to his absence during that time. And so I think it actually enhances it does. It does exactly what, uh, you know, a sequel or a prequel should do. It enhances the material that it's spun off from. And so I think that this having an actual substantive adventure happening in that time when I go back and rewatch Rebels, I'll actually enjoy. I'll be like, ah, I know where he was. That, yeah. That'll be nice. Yes, that's the great thing about tie novels. When they do that, that's that's their job is to fill in those blanks and then change your perspective when you go back and watch those episodes. Yeah, yeah, and I I agree with you guys because uh, you know I think I even remember thinking this to myself. I wonder where Thrawn is in this season, like because you know he just kind of leaves, you know, and the fact that like it seems weird that they would call him back and then. You know, once Zahn started doing the Thrawn novels, I thought to myself, in the time period, I was like, I bet that they fill that in with a novel. And I think this is one of those places where, and I I don't know this for certain, but it does kind of seem like to me this could have been something they worked out on purpose to be able to to tell this story. Um, And, you know, if the fact that the novels can work more closely with the actual material um, like that is really great. And like you said, John, I, I think I felt the same way about this book in, in the sense that it truly enhances now when I go back and rewatch the end of season three, end of season four of Rebels, and it tying in where we are, too, in the history of Star Wars. Like, this book does a really good job of, of showing us just how close we are to, you know, Rogue One, just how close we are to having the Death Star completed and, and, and all of those things. And so I think all of that enhances Rebels again, too, because it, it shows the validity of what those Rebels on Lothal are doing and how important that is. Um, so I just I really appreciate that. And uh, plus, you know, just helps explain to why their actions as well really kill the idea of the Defender Project, um, mm-hmm. which... You know, for the Empire is too bad because it's a good idea. So, um, so I, something that surprised me about the novel was just how much we see Palpatine really playing everyone. Like it, it's it. He is like this, you know, evil puppet master who just loves poking people's buttons and watching them go. And I just thought that that was a really, I, I don't know, to me it just, it seemed like the thing that helped explain in a lot of ways why the Empire would never last. Because Palpatine's management style is not one that facilitates long-term success, honestly. Well, the th- criticism sometimes of Thrawn is that he figures everything out too easily. But I hadn't even thought about the fact that really it's Palpatine. Because Palpatine pushes all these buttons and he's the puppet master, like you said. But after reading this book, I started to wonder, did Palpatine really know that if he pushed certain buttons, this story would play out the way it did? Like it created the results that he wanted from it. So he was able to just kind of steer everybody in the direction he wanted to go, that he knew what was really going on with these supply lines, but he wanted Thrawn to deal with it he wanted Tarkin involved he wanted all these players involved in it to get him to where he wanted the story to play out so a puppet master uses puppets to tell a story and he's pushing those buttons for this to play out the way he wants it to yeah I uh, I, I mean the thing is I consider it more a confirmation 
of, you know, I, it makes sense that this is Palpatine's management style, setting people against each other. And in addition to the whole setting them against each other thing, um, it's a it's the Sith philosophy. The cream will rise to the top. I'm going to set you all in opposition to each other. And then the best will come through. And that's who's going to win. And um, so it would be very much in line with the philosophy. But in terms of it being any different than what I would have expected Palpatine to do, not really. I think that the added layer that it gives is it gives a lot of confirmation through Ronan's point of view about how many of the positions are politically appointed positions. So, you know, it reinforces the idea that Palpatine's biggest management error isn't so much that he set people against each other, but that he had no problem with putting incompetent people in charge in different positions. Yeah, that's I, that's a really great thought because, and that's, I love that part of the book because, you know, we see how Palpatine's style, when people kind of realize this, it turns people off to the Empire because it stops them believing in what they thought the Empire was, which is something that was actually good for the galaxy when they see that really it's just another corrupt political system that honestly, it not any better or worse than, you know, the, the worst corruption of the Republic, right? And so all of these people that had kind of bought into that, like a Ronin, who really truly believed or, you know, uh, and, and you get the feeling like Krennic is one of those type of people, too, um, throughout this book, because we see Krennic through Ronin's eyes and uh, the type of person that he is. Like, he's somebody who truly believes in the BS of the Empire's propaganda. Um, but when they see behind the facade, it's it's, you know, an empty tomb. It's it's just. It, there's there's nothing behind it that that rhetoric and it, just to, to jump on top of that i think that uh, a fairly interesting sort of thing you could spin from that is that ronan has that moment where you know he's disillusioned and people are getting disillusioned the empire is just another political machine no different than the worst corruption of the republic to use your words well that's the machine that Palpatine came out of. The reason that they thought the Republic yeah, sucked. Nobody puts two and two together and says, well, wait a minute. Maybe the reason the Republic sucked is because our last chancellor was terrible. And wait, he's the emperor now, too. You know, like, hey, look, hmm. what's what's the constant in this equation? Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good yeah. point. Yeah, it's surprising that never <laughs> comes up where people are trying to fight against the emperor because it didn't work in the Republic. So what makes us think he can do the empire? Yeah. Right. Right. Well, because he got rid of all those other people that were causing the problem. <laughs> yes, it was right? their you know? fault. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and I think what's what is really interesting is the way that Zahn uses Thrawn as the juxtaposition to Palpatine's leadership. Because look, Thrawn is a bad guy in the sense that he's he's pretty much somebody who believes that the ends justify the means. Because that's why he's here at the Empire. He's willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that his people survive. Um, and he feels like the best way to do that is to be a part of the Empire, whatever it takes. So that's where his evil comes in. But at the same time, he's also somebody that believes that for the Empire to be the best that it can be, this leadership style is not the way to go. And we see that play out in how he leads on his ship. Um, and the way in which he is, you know, he's building into these, um, you know, senior officers on his ship that are under him. You know, he did the same thing with Vanto. He did the same thing with Faro, who's on his ship now at this point. Um, you know, and he even sees uh, the cracks for Ronan by the end. Um, and he has a whole different style. And I just it, it's interesting to see because in many ways. Thrawn is is the actual embodiment of the propaganda of the Empire. And honestly, it probably would have lasted a lot longer if more people like him had been in charge of the Empire because the Empire would have actually been more benevolent in many ways. Um, people would have been able to see it as being more benevolent in many ways. Um just because of that type of leadership trickling down from on high. 
So, um, and, and people not seeing that corruption is the way to go. Um, so I just found, I, to me, I find that fascinating that Thrawn is this kind of foil in that way for, for the empire and the Palpatine. And he's, he's the only one who's actually the, the most true Imperial. Well, I think he definitely, um, separates it out in terms of, uh, you know, to speak to your, like, Thrawn is trying to make the military work the way that it should. And so he's, he admittedly says, you know, repeatedly says, I don't know how politics work. How do politics work? And it sort of draws into distinction that that is one of the core problems is that the politics intertwining with the military are what make the military even worse for the galaxy because it becomes a lever of power for people who are put in those positions and their only interest is for their own personal benefit. And so when you get somebody like Thrawn, who's looking at a larger game and isn't looking at it in terms of what can I personally benefit, but every action he's taking is, how does this make the military better? How does this make the Chiss Ascendancy stronger? How does this make this stronger? But then you also get this interesting counterpoint because uh, Aralani makes reference to the fact that the Ascendancy is getting ready to go to war with itself. And so Thrawn, in a sense, is in this environment where the Ascendancy is in danger of going. And so, in a sense, if you think about it, he's studying what's going wrong with the Empire so that maybe he can bring it back to the Ascendancy and un- you know disentangle those threads that have to do with their political problems. See, it's interesting, though, Matt, when you said about him being evil, it's like I, the more I read about him, and especially in this book, I think of him being less evil. And I mean, I know he's evil, but in the sense that he's integrated himself into the Empire to protect his own people, I feel like, you know, he's teaming up with the enemy to protect his own people. So it's like, you know, keep your enemies closer. And the fact... Yeah, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Exactly. And it's like, that's the new perspective I've been gaining on this character as we're reading through these things. And I appreciate the character more because of that. So this Mm -hmm. intertwining between his people and the empire and all that, it's, he's like, he is, he's like the perfect officer for the empire because he's actually in the empire to protect and that's what the Empire really should be doing. And the Empire is not doing that itself. It's not protecting its own people. So in a sense, because he's protecting mm, his people yeah. through the Empire, he's making the Empire really, truly what it should be. Yeah, and I, I do agree with that. You know, I've just heard the criticism um, from certain circles that, you know, Thrawn in the books and Thrawn in the TV show don't seem to mix because the Thrawn in the TV show seems to be more quote unquote evil, you know? Yeah. And that's where I'm just saying, it's like there are two facets we're getting to see of Thrawn. And I think the facet that we see in the show is the Thrawn who is, is that whatever it takes mentality to do what you said. And that's where it's like, there is an evil in him in the sense that he is a, um, bottom line kind of guy, you know? Uh, and, and it, the, he do, he's not going to um, shudder at the idea that he has to do something that could cost lots of lives, um, but he also isn't going to do that as his first inclination like most Im- Imperials might do, but he's still not going to not do that just because a lot of lives might be lost. So I just, I, I, and I appreciate just like you, the idea that there's more nuance to this character than we had had before, and yet, you know, there's certain times you're like, oh, you could see him not being a villain and oh, you could see him being a villain, you know, and like it goes back and forth, this seesaw of like, oh, man, I wish he would just pick a side. But I think that's what makes him so interesting is that he doesn't. The only side he has, really, it seems, is to protect the Chiss people. That's the side he's chosen the most. Uh, well, and I think there's also an important distinction to draw that. Thrawn in the TV show, number one, the show is from the perspective of our heroes. He's working for the Empire. The Empire is the enemy. And he he doesn't have reason 
at any point to sit down and have a long talk with Kanan and say, well, let me explain how things work in the Chiss Ascendancy and all of that stuff. Thrawn's doing exactly in this book what he's sent to do in Rebels, which is there's a problem, go fix it. And he's got that single-minded, all right, well, let's let's fix this problem and get it done. And I, so I don't see as much of a uh, discordant thing between uh, the two, you know, the the two sides of his character here. I, I, it's a more fleshed out picture thanks to the books, but I don't think that there's anything in contradiction. Yeah, no, I agree because I mean, I even mean, think of that that moment. Say, um, I think it's in season three, late season three, or it could be season four, where they're at the. Uh, imperial workshop there on lothal and he has the person get on the speeder and he knows that you know it's it's been um sabotaged and he has them ride the speeder basically until it pulls up and people kind of pointed to that and been like see he's you know he's so evil but i'm also thinking in my head thrawn also is trying to save lives by getting people to stop rebelling against the empire by sacrificing one to hopefully save many right like, mm-hmm. that's his thought process in that moment. Yes, like you said, John, you, you see that from the perspective of our heroes, and it's, you know, it's just outrageously villainous. But there is another side to that, and that's what I think I like about these books, is they allow us to see that that thought process inside his head that you can't get on a TV show, because the show is not called Thrawn. The show is called Rebels. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, and the thing is, he's still villainous. Like I, I understand the point here, where you are root, you're put in a position to root for him, but I have always experienced it sort of like it was watching uh, the Shield, where Vic Mackey and his strike team are terrible, awful people, and the show continually puts you in this position of saying, "Well, okay, but they're." All right, but they're working for the greater good. Oh, okay, but you know, the do the ends justify the means here? And it constantly puts that weird question in front of you, and then every so often you have to snap out of it and say, "Well, no, 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 no. Vic Mackey's a bad guy. He's a bad guy. I don't care if he's charming or if he figures out solutions or if he solved a bigger problem. He's still a bad guy." So, and so there's your advertisement to watch The Shield uh, if you so desire. <laughs> yeah, but he and I I think you're right. I mean, even though I think of him a little less evil, he's still evil. And I guess what I mean is he's not just that one dimensional evil character. He's just mm-hmm. not, you know, I'm just here for the empire and I'm evil. Ha 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 ha. I mean, he's doing something to protect his people. So there's some honor to it in a sense, but mm-hmm. he's still evil. He still kills people. He's still the empire. When I think, uh, you know, one of the, the good examples for me is the way in which the prequels help you completely understand Darth Vader in a whole new sense Mm. you know and I think these books in lots of ways are those kind of prequels for the Rebels series that give you an insight into Thrawn that you don't have before them you know and now that you have them it makes like you said Bruce he is just a character there's so much more uh, there's so many more dimensions I mean Thrawn is like uh, an onion you know um you keep peeling back the layers and then there's more to him, which is great because that's kind of what you want from a villain is one that you could actually kind of sympathize with everyone's fun, understand their thought process that it doesn't just make them so easy to hate them, you know? And I mean, that's obviously what I think the prequels kind of do for Darth Vader in that sense of, of giving you the downfall of Anakin and the way that we could go through that intellectually to get there, you know, like Thrawn, I think, even more so, we could intellectualize doing some of the things that he does for the reasons he's doing them because we could see why it might be for the greater good kind of thing, you know, and the danger of that kind of thought process. It's great mm-hmm. stuff. Well, also, when you have a book that's about Thrawn, you're rooting for Thrawn. But when I see Thrawn in Rebels or the original Thrawn trilogy, I'm rooting against him. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that absolutely. has something to do with it, too. No, it's true. Um, you know, and I think it's it's fun because, you know, for for Zahn, you know, Bruce, we've heard him many a times talk at Dragon Con about the idea that for him, the character is the same character, 
you know, he doesn't see any distinction between the character from Rebels and what he's writing here to the character you would see in the Thrawn trilogy, um, you know, from, and so he sees how that character would be that same character. So to me, that's, that's fascinating. And I think for the most part, I can kind of see that too. Again, the, those books are not from Thrawn's perspective in the sense that, you know, we're rooting for our heroes, not for Thrawn, who is the villain. So that's, yeah, it's good stuff. For you guys, uh, too, we, we we have Stardust here, uh, the Death Star project. And, and this is the whole reason that Thrawn is called away from the fall, is to deal with this supply lines issue that Krennic is having to the Death Star. Um, which they think are being disrupted by Greylocks, which are related to Minox, but um, larger. And um, it doesn't quite turn out that way. And and this is the part of the book that I thought was really interesting. One, just getting into all of this stuff about the impact of the Stardust Project on the rest of the Empire um, and the way it impacts all of these people. Um, but also, too, just the, the, the idea that, you know, Thrawn is pretty much Sherlock Holmes, and so what do we do? We throw at him a mystery that nobody else can solve, just like Sherlock Holmes. And it seems like this is the match made in heaven for the type of Thrawn broker you want at this point. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. I was <laughs> I was original, uh, originally thinking of him more along the lines of uh, Columbo. You know, I know you did it. I'm going to prove you did it, and here's how I'm going to prove how you did it. Like, and it's just he, he's just sort of like playing that game where it's like I, I I've already figured all of this out. We're we're just going to get there together, you know. So you can, learn. In, in a sense, what I love about this book is that more than the other Thrawn books, I felt more like an Eli Vanto character or a Pharaoh character, where I was, I, it felt like Thrawn was teaching me as he went. What do you see now? What are the conclusions you're drawing now? And so I think that one of the great uh, subtleties of Zahn's writing is that he manages to put you in that sort of situation very, very deftly where you're learning from Thrawn as you go, but you never feel like you're being pandered to. There's not this omniscient voice of... I know everything. It very much feels like a lesson. And I think that a lot of that has to do with um, just the way that he brings the supporting characters to life. Because, you you know, with Vanto and Pharaoh and Ronan, you're all learning along with them, uh, you know, a, as you go along. And I, I, I do agree with you that this is this is exactly the type of story that the Thrawn character is just absolutely built for. You know, the, the thing you're talking about, the feeling like you're learning from Thrawn as it goes along, I felt more that way in the first book of this trilogy because mm. of him kind of mentoring Fanto. Uh, so I got a lot more of it then, and I felt like we lost a little bit of it in the second book. And then in this book, it came back again. And I really mm. like that because that's the thing that stood out to me when we read the first book is really learning from Thrawn and the thought process and how he gets there, as opposed to him just revealing, oh, this is what's happened. It's like now he's telling us how he comes to these conclusions, how to think through things. And what I really uh, liked about uh, Vanto in this book is we see that he has learned from that. He almost is like a mini Thrawn. He's really yeah. becoming the next Thrawn uh, Jr., if that's even possible. But I also didn't like it. Thrawn Jr. Thrawn Jr. But I also, I was a little annoyed that they called this project Stardust because I always thought it was Galen Urso's pet name for it. And that wasn't used yeah. throughout the whole empire. And at first it annoyed me, but now I actually like it. That's the code name that they're all using because they don't want to refer to it as Death Star. So that one. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like saying you're the Decepticons. It's like, yeah, you, know, you kind of feel like you're just throwing it out there what you are. Right. 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 So. Although it's of course, it, I mean, it's also supported by the fact that that's the name of the file that they find on um, mm -hmm. on Scarif. Right. So, you know, I, I guess I mean, I, I get I I understand your point with it. I, I think it's a, a neat little trick, though, because, of course, it's a callback to Rogue One. But I like the fact that at least they had a cover name so that when Thrawn or somebody else says Death Star, like in his final conversation with the emperor, the emperor is like. 
still at the point of essentially saying, how the hell does he even know this name? How did this get back to him? What, like, what, <laughs> how did he outfox me on this one? You know? And so it's, it's, um, you know, I, I think it's a, uh, you know, a fun sort of, sort of twist, but I understand your point with that. Absolutely. Well, that's one of the things that, um, I think I really liked about this, this whole part of the story was, you know, you guys were both talking about Thrawn in the way in which we kind of learned from him. And I liked the way in which the protégés that he had, as Bruce affectionately termed them, the, you know, Thrawn juniors, hmm. which I think is great for Vanto and Pharaoh because they really are those characters. They they have learned from him and they are learning how to think the way that he thinks, which is so neat to see that, you know, what Thrawn has can be learned if you're willing to learn, which is great. It, it makes him, um, I think, not to say less special, but it, it makes him less special, you know, in the sense that like, oh, he's just this like character that nobody else can be like. No, if you are taught correctly, you can actually be like him. You just have to be willing to learn the way that he has obviously been willing to learn. And so I love that because, you know, you get to the end, you know, and, and he asks Pharaoh because he doesn't know why she deviated from his plans, even though he realizes that they worked out better than the plans that he had. Yeah. And she explains it to him. And it's just like this moment where like you can really see these characters progressing because of his tutelage. Um, but the, 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 also the, there is this interesting, a bit of humility in Thrawn to be able to say, you did something better than I thought of. Tell me why. And I think that's a really neat thing to see in a character like this. And I think also the thing that I'm I'm very much hoping that maybe Zahn set up some as much as I want them to find Thrawn again, you know, post Rebels, post Jedi sort of thing and, and, and have that go on. Um, I like the fact with Pharaoh in specific and of course Vanto is there as well, but he's, you know, off in the ascendancy. But with Pharaoh being in her position, I'm there's a part of me that's sincerely hoping that Zahn has set up a in this one. Uh, like a backdoor pilot for the Pharaoh show in the First Order era so that we could see Thrawn's oh, legacy survive, even in book cool. format, so that yeah. we could have a reference to it. And that becomes a tie between the eras right there that I think would work really, really like I, I got this sense that Pharaoh becomes his legacy when yeah. he's gone. Well, maybe Admiral Pharaoh and Captain Pelion. I'm just saying. Oh, do you know? Yeah, please. He's there too. So that would be great. Be yeah. I I 100% agree with you. I think that would be fantastic. And the uh, so all of this around Thrawn, Stardust, and everything. I also thought was fascinating to see the way in which people have reacted, John, in this book, in the ways that we reacted when we talked about this on aggressive negotiations on our show. So you want to build a Death Star. Um, <laughs> yeah. The idea that maybe the Death Star isn't really the best use of Imperial resources uh, for the Navy budget. And apparently other people in the Navy thought the same way we did because Admiral Savit, uh, Grand Admiral Savit, didn't like this idea that, that the Navy was having all of its resources bled towards one massive battle station. Uh, and that we were not, you know, building more ships, that we weren't, uh, you know... Ha- doing something like the Defender Project, you know, all of these type of things that we weren't, that they weren't thinking basically smarter yeah. um, about the Imperial Navy. And I just loved that Thrawn thinks that too. We're not the only ones who think the Death Star might not be the best plan. Yeah. No, and, and the and the fact that they, they bring in Krennic, I, I always love seeing Krennic uh, because he was the high point of, uh, you know, of Rogue One and everything, but just this idea also that if you even boil it down into its simple bureaucratic terms, mm-hmm. it's not even just that, you know, Krennic believes in it or the Emperor believes it, that it's it's a power play. If Krennic loses the Death Star, then he loses his status and his position. And Tarkin wants the Death Star because it gives him status and position. And 
so then you you know you see Savit trying to undercut it because he wants to take that away from them. It's not just that the Death Star is a a bad idea in his part, but it's also giving power and prestige to other people, and that's what makes Thrawn in relief so shown so brilliantly being the one who's who is motivated by you know for lack of a better term so, sort of an altruistic thing of he really just cares that much about the defender project he doesn't care about whether he's going to get the the position related with it he's not jockeying for that project he doesn't care fine build the death star just give me my defenders because that's best for everybody sort of thing and i think that's um yeah i you know, but but yeah i i agree i i think that it also serves to very much um buttress the you know the, the overall theme of how politics is a cancer even in the empire and especially in the imperial fleet i mean when everything is political it seems like you the lesson is everybody suffers yes yeah very true yeah and the other thing that i liked is you know i hadn't really thought a whole lot about it until i read this one but the death star really is a bad idea because, I, again, this is one of these things <laughs> where, you know, in the book, even Thrawn says towards the end about, you know, well, you know, there's there's could be a, there's a weakness to it. You know, it could be destroyed. Like there was all this talk throughout the book that it would come up occasionally by different characters about, you know, the the Death Star. It, it has it has some issues with it. There's some things that, you know, could lead to its destruction or it wouldn't work or whatever. And it's like, yeah. That's one big gun you have, and if it's gone, it's gone. You spent all this time, all these resources, all this money, whatever, into one object that if it completely fails or if it's destroyed, you're done. As opposed to a fleet, which is can be spread out throughout the galaxy. I mean, if a mm-hmm. fleet, you know, gets of tide destroyers gets or defenders gets destroyed, then you've got another fleet somewhere else and you can just keep building and building and building. So it makes more sense to go with the fleet than one big round gun. Yeah, no, absolutely. Although, and even to, to, you know, to support that, I I had a, no, I mean, I, 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 you know, I wrote a blog, like, I don't know how long ago about like, you know, death star death match where it's like, we know that the second one's going to be built and it was being built somewhat concurrently you know, after, you know, the the Death Star 1 is in process and everything like that. So, like, obviously the end game was eventually we weren't going to have a fleet of Star Destroyers. We were going to have a bunch of Death Stars going around. And even then it's like, well, where do you go from there? Like, then you have, then you've truly given, you know, killer power to all of your governors and all of your higher ranking things. So people are zipping around, destroying each other's systems as they, you know, as they move around. So in a best case scenario, you've just got galactic Armageddon when you build these things. Well, and they I did mean, get to, destroyed anyway, both times. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I mean, to quote our uh, friend from that other franchise, talk about dining on ashes. Yeah. You know. Although uh, I, I'll also offer a slight correction there, Bruce. Three times. They got destroyed three times. on. That's Bill. true. That is yeah, true. Yes. Yeah. All on the first day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> there wasn't even an official ribbon cutting. <laughs> they never even get it past a day. <laughs> it was the soft opening. They hadn't that even was had just the grand the trial opening. Run. I mean, you know, I, they had a whole ceremony set up for <laughs> for that thing and they were they were going to bring out the 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 ribbons and the band and you know, uh, Man, oh well, goodness. That, that's why um, they have to have a fourth one so that they can borrow the uh, Jaws 4 tagline, this time it's personal. <laughs> you know? Yes. Right. I mean, it's so sad, too. I mean, Phasma had a whole dance number planned, and, you know, <laughs> yes. Ka- you know Hux was, had an even better speech, so. Phasma is uh, her own disco ball. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so true she just hangs up her helmet and spins it just spins around (laughs) oh gosh so one of the things about this book that i love is the i mean to me the chiss have always been fascinating and honestly you know even with the eu they're a race that we don't know a ton about and i thought it was great that this book finally gives us more insight into what we kind of learned with the throne alliances book with their navigators we get why Vanto was sent there and the fact that we meet an admiral from the Chiss Navy, Arlani, who allows us to be to see a slightly different side of the Chiss. 
that, you know, we all think maybe they're just all like Thrawn, but we really get to see some variation in the, in these characters. And to me, you know, you're John, you're talking about spinoff series. Like I kind of want to see the series now that follows Vanto back with the Chiss, you know, through the original trilogy where we're seeing what they're doing. Cause to me, this stuff is fascinating. Yeah. Agree. That, that would be, uh, if you had like a lost star sort of thing, even where there's stuff going on the in the ascendancy, but they're keeping tabs on what's happening with the empire, and you can get their perspective. You know, they're ob- mm, yeah. you know they're obviously great observers, and you know their perspective of oh yeah, called it oh that's a surprise. You know that that sort of thing. When you said lost stars, I thought you wanted a romantic just kiss novel or something you know well, hey wait a minute we got uh we got the possibility with uh vanto and uh Vinaya. yeah but yeah, oh, we, yeah we got that possibility true. right there that's true right? that yeah. could work i don't know what and it th- is about blue aliens but i like to see more of them i mean it's like in star trek i'm like really fascinated more and more with andorians and they're blue too <laughs> i don't know because yeah. blue is my favorite color but it just that's the thing i liked about this novel was seeing more of the this race there and seeing all these blue aliens with those red eyes. And I just became very fascinated with them. I mean, Thrawn's a fascinating character, but now you've got all these others and yeah, I would love to see a spinoff novel, just like you were saying, Matt, just like, you know, you guys Mm -hmm. just like, you know, this whole thing of like what happens next with them. And I want to go to their home world and I want to learn more and more and more about them. I mean, the, the big hit, in the Chiss Ascendancy uh, from Keith Urban is blue is your color. So, um, and I do blue prefer your color. blue melt. <laughs> yeah. See, there, there you go. Uh, <laughs> no, I agree with you. I, I just like, I, to me, the, the fact that the reason that Vanto was sent there is because he's so good with finding patterns and that the reason they want him is to examine the histories and the genetics and the family f- flow and everything else that they could um, about the navigators so that they can learn more about them, try and unlock the secrets. Plus, they un- they really want to unlock the secrets of why Vinaya is somebody who has been able to hold on to what they call the third sight, uh, this kind of uh, force ability that has usually faded by the time that they get to her age. Um, so you really see the... It almost kind of reminds me of almost like an X-Men thing, you know, where they're trying to figure out mutations and stuff mm-hmm. um, to understand where it comes from and all that kind of thing. Like, to me, this... It's about as far sci-fi as you want to go with Star Wars in the sense of really kind of going hard sci-fi. But it's fascinating because I feel like Zahn has set up the opportunity to really explore a, a Star Wars race that I, I'm i just inclined to really want to know more about. And that's really cool in Star Wars because, you know, I can't think of honestly many races where we truly know all that much about them. They're just kind of like surface level for most of the aliens and I just I want to go farther with the Chiss because they they really are just a fascinating culture. And are they force sensitive? Is that really what that is? And can they not retain the yeah. force? Yeah, yeah. And that's what I was going to say. Is it is it really hard sci fi? Because if the force is you know what binds the galaxy together, and we know about midichlorians, is it just another great example of what Lucas himself? you know, explored where it's like, you know, people discovered the force and these things, but they didn't necessarily call it that. And they didn't necessarily know about midichlorians or anything like that. It's just, this was just a thing. It was like, they just knew that it was a thing and okay. And maybe their scientific exploration finds them to discover, oh, wow, it is something that we have and can develop and and stuff like that. No, I think again, like, it's neat to say that reading a Thrawn book that there are th- things beyond Thrawn in the book that I would be interested in following. And I think that's a hallmark of Zahn's writing is that he's done a good job of creating things um, that it's not just all about Thrawn, you know, that there are other things too that he's created that are really fascinating that I would like to see more of. And, you know, we already know that he can do that because he did that with the Thrawn trilogy. He did it with the Hand of Thrawn trilogy. He has the ability to to really, I think, key in on some just interesting stuff. And it's interesting to me that, too, 
You know, he's he's one of those people who's just been able to add neat things to Star Wars that I can't separate from, like, you know, like, that's really neat. Like, he's one of the few people who's really added something to Star Wars that I will never let go of, like the character of Thrawn or the Chiss. Like, that's huge. Yeah, I think that uh, Zahn is the type of author who's incredibly easy to take for granted. And by that, I mean he is incredibly gifted at what he does and how he constructs these stories and how he inhabits this specific franchise, this genre and this franchise. Uh, But as a result, he's been around for so long and he has done such a good job of building these things. It's like one of those things where you don't even realize what a, what an incredible thing he has done in his Mm -hmm. works to advance you know, the the galaxy and the world building and expanding everything out for us because he's not a flashy author. He's not the type of author that draws that type of attention to themselves. He just does the work. And I think that that is one of the things where I always rejoice when he's coming out with another Star Wars book because I consider him so integral to this whole venture because he knows how it works and he knows how to push it forward and in such a way that fans from every single uh, segment of fandom will accept it. They won't push back on it. He knows how to talk to us, basically. Yeah. No, that's a that's a really good point. Um, and, you know, just... I think uh, I've always appreciated, you know, the the humility that he has, you know, because the success that he's had in Star Wars and, and the books that he's written, he's still flabbergasted, I think, that this worked, you know, that, that people responded the way that they did. Um, and he says that every time you see him in an interview, you know, he just, he, you put something out there, you don't know how people respond to it, and people ended up loving it, you know, and he... he he got the he's the beneficiary of us loving his work, but in the end, I think it's because originally it was just good work. Um, yeah, know. well, I, I mean, think about it. You know, the the first book to come out post Return of the Jedi, the first real book to come out post Return of the Jedi, and he creates one of the most beloved characters in the history of the franchise. You know, I mean, like that's immediately going to endear you to the fans, and then to get the opportunity to bring them back and find a way to make it work in this new continuity that they have. I mean, that's, that is some, that's some serious chops, man. Yeah. And I start to wonder at times, is he getting tired of Thrawn? Then when they come back and say, Hey, write another Thrawn novel, do another Thrawn series, Thrawn, Thrawn, Thrawn. He's pro I don't know if he feels this way, but I start to wonder if he's like, you know, I don't want to be just the Thrawn writer. I'm new. I know he's written a few other little things here and there in star Wars, but primarily about Thrawn. But when you read a book like this, it's like, how could he not, you know, he, he can't be bored with this character because this is so good. I mean, it's such good storytelling. So this character allows him to do exactly what it is that we're talking about and just add to that Star Wars mythos and to the galaxy. Well, and that's one of the things, you know, John, you and I were talking on aggressive negotiations the other week about this idea of the unknown regions. And this book, touches back on that idea because we're of course we're with the chiss and we're with the grisks who play a large part in this novel because uh both of them do and and they're looking to expand their influence in what we know of the star wars galaxy um during this time period there and and their way of dominating people sounds just as scary as the siths uh Mm -hmm. and so I I think, you know, I feel like we're really setting something up with these two races that we're, and of course that Batu is right there on on the edge of wild space and the unknown regions. Like, we've got to use this, you know. We we've got to this this has to go somewhere. Yeah, it does, and I would be thrilled if it did. I I want it to very much. I. You know, to to your point, Bruce, about like, you know, is he tired? Maybe Pharaoh's the back door that he can, you know, continue on um, with a Thrawn-like sort of setup and reference him and stuff like that. But 
I don't want him ever to get tired of writing Star Wars. I want him continually to want to come back, and I want people to heap praise and love on him when he shows up at conventions so he knows how appreciated he is, so that he does keep writing these books. And You know, I, I think uh, Scoundrels was uh, the one with Han and Lando that he wrote. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That one, I enjoyed that one. Um, and I... Uh, I, oh God! It, well, he's written so many that like I can't even keep all the titles in my head, you know. But yeah, I, I definitely want him to come back, and I want him to build on that. And since we have black, we have a Black Spire series now. Hey, come on back! You know, like there's no reason not to. You know, you have your opening right here. You're touching on the unknown regions. This Batu is an actual physical tie that Disney has an interest in keeping alive in every way possible. You have your your focus point here to use as an excuse to bring these things back to us. I don't know what the plan is for the unknown regions, of course. I get excited every time I see a book or, or anything that talks about the unknown regions because I'm very fascinated by it. I don't know if this will have a play in Episode 9 because, as this recording, the movie hasn't come out yet. But if it doesn't have a play or isn't explained or explored in that movie or any other future movies, I would love for Zahn to be the author that explores that region because he does have the Chiss in there. We have the Grisk. And, and you know, the, the interesting about the Grisk is that they, they, they grab other races, other beings, and make them into slaves. And, and we find in this book that even when they abandon those slaves or their slaves are removed from them, that they still are loyal to them. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a certain power the Grisk have on them. And it would be interesting to me if the Grisk have that same power over other Chiss and the unknown regions and what their dominance is, if they have any. I mean, it's just a whole nother area to explore that's that's even more interesting to me than the Yuzhan Vaughn, you know? And uh, I'd like to see this play out. Yeah, I think, you know, when you think about that, they, they've created an alien race which is terrifying. Um, because it, it seems to create, you know, almost zombie like devotion in the the slaves that they have, which is something we're all terrified of, you know, just in our own world in general. The the idea of ideas taking over people in a way that leaves them powerless to do anything else. And so, um and, and leaves them no freedom. Uh and so I think that's that's a really uh good place to move and, and you have you know, you got 30 years to play with between the, the Force Awakens and Return of the Jedi there. You know, those two movies got a lot of time. So, you know, it, this feels like something that could be a part of that. Um, it also feels like something that could be a play for what we'd go into with a Thrawn, Ezra, Sabine, you know, Ahsoka tri- the mm-hmm. series or something like that, maybe. Um, maybe, you know, giving a good explanation as to why Ahsoka wouldn't be around. Um, you know, uh, during that period as well. Um, so it, you know, there's so much that's happening there, and and it it's it would make for a great series because it would completely expand Star Wars in a whole new way that there wouldn't be a lot of expectations because you honestly wouldn't know what to expect each week because you're not playing with pieces on the board that we already know, which mm-hmm. I think would be really cool. So, um, yeah, I just. You know, this Unknown Regions thing, it's its its here again in this book, and I just would love to see it expand on it more. And John, you and I talked about this for like 45 minutes the other day on aggressive negotiations. Yes, so, yep. Yeah, people can go check that out if they wanted more. Um, I'm really interested, though, because, you know, I feel like that we have been heaping copious amounts of praise on this book so far. And so to kind of get down to um, the the brass tacks of it all what are your ratings then for thrawn treason bruce yeah i think it's pretty obvious that i do really enjoy this book um i I think i enjoyed it more than i thought because i said you know i wonder if zon sometimes gets tired of writing thrawn and there's times where i go to a thrawn book and i'm like "Eh, you know I've, I've, i've we've had a lot of thrawn do i want more of thrawn and i would say when i got halfway through this book i got to a point that i couldn't put it down and I just wanted to keep going and going. As a matter of fact, I was on a business conference. Every free moment I had, I was just like mm-hmm. reading in between here and there. So, 
yeah, uh, I would rate this book fairly high. I would say I give this book, um, I give this book four and a half unknown places to go in the unknown region. <laughs> Ooh, nice. Five. Nice. It's like a little mystery. It is. <laughs> uh, I am, I, I'm very much, I, I, I'm with you, Bruce, where it hit that halfway point and I could not stop reading. Like I lost sleep because I started reading too, you know, <laughs> picked it up too late one night and I suddenly looked at the clock. I was like, oh, it's 1230. Oh, okay. One more chapter, you know, sort of thing. And, uh, you know, I, um, so I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, you know, I, my typical dance is like, if I gave this book to my wife, she wouldn't, she'd read it. She'd be like, what the hell are you talking about? You know? So it's like, I can't separate it that way. Um, if there's one thing I would ping for it, I don't like that Thrawn is the one that recommended vader for the death star um unless you later head cannon it out to be that the emperor maneuvered him into a position to recommend it or something which doesn't make sense in and of itself because i have my i have my own head cannon constructed about the whole thing with the death star um as it turns out but it could very well be that you know that's a whole rabbit hole though um and that's me being nitpicky me about it so it, I would say that as an everyday reader, it's a solid four, but as a Star Wars fan, it's a four and a half. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really great. Yeah, um, I'll just say uh, on the Death Star Vader thing, um, I thought that that worked well personally because I didn't have any headcanon for myself about that. And um, it made sense to me that they had forged a relationship and Thrawn alliances. And I think Vader, I think Thrawn appreciated that Vader didn't play politics mm. very much. And that's why he wanted him over the Death Star. He wanted mm. him to be the one looking over the Death Star because he trusted Vader not to be the one playing politics uh, as much as everybody else was. And so that's where I came down on that and why I thought it was really interesting. And it made sense to me that Thrawn would recommend that. So, but I could also understand absolutely like having Cardi even already work something in your head, you know, because of all those years that we haven't had any story. So, and that that's different. So, yeah, I'm with you guys. You know, this is a clear four out of five for me. Um, I could, I could definitely say, um, as a Star Wars fan, though, like if we're just grading as, as Star Wars material for Star Wars fans, I would definitely say it's four and a half out of five. You know, this is exactly what you want. And, you know, I, this is, if we're wrapping up, you know, Thrawn in this era, this is the way I wanted him to go out. You know, like, mm -hmm. he comes away with a very interesting win here um, in many ways because the win for him wasn't so much about all the things going on with the Empire. It's more about what's going back on back at home. And, you know, he's pulled away another guy from the Empire that he feels like could be a benefit to the Ascendancy right mm. under, you know, Palpatine's nose. And Palpatine only has an inkling of possibility of, of Thrawn maybe, you know, being treasonous, but he's still using him, you know, and then he'll disappear and he will never know. So, um, you know, I just, I, to me, this is a really fascinating place to leave him because it makes me even more interested to see Thrawn again. Like yeah. in the future, like where does he go with Ezra and what happens with him? And like, who is he when he comes back? You know, is, is he the same type of character? Do him and Ezra have adventures that make him a completely different type of character in the sense of like, does he move more towards uh, a light side representation than the dark side? You know, but maybe somewhere still kind of in the middle. Who knows? Like there's so much you could do with this character to me that would fascinate me. So I, it's great work, you know, and I think it makes for a very good trilogy in this era. Um, and, you know, so I, to me, some of the strongest books we've had in the new canon. So I'm um, just so excited that we get a chance to talk about these things. Really appreciate the fact that we have incredible associate producers here through Patreon. Ken Tripp, Davis Grayson, Wyan Millette, Daniel Noah. They support the show every month through Patreon. And they have chosen the 602 Club to be associate producers here uh, because they give it a certain level and they appreciate what we do here on this show. 
Uh, but they also appreciate everything that we do through the Trek FM network. Um, there is so much happening here. It's a very big network. And if you know anything about what's going on with Star Trek right now, there is a lot that's going to be coming. So we need your help to make sure all of the shows keep coming to you each and every week. It's a very expensive thing to put on a network of this size. So we definitely encourage you, if you can give a little bit to make sure that that happens each and every week, uh, each and every month, that's really appreciated. Again, go to patreon.com slash trekfm. We have some different contribution levels you can give at, but honestly, in the end, every little bit helps. So again, that's patreon.com slash trekfm. Bruce, just a blast to have you back, man. Um, We need to uh, do this more often, but uh, where can people find you if they want to catch up with you well you can find me here on the network doing literary treks with dan gunther talking about the star trek books and comics and you can find me doing live from the edge when a new episode of star trek discovery comes out brandy jacola and i do that the next night live on youtube and it's part of the edge feed and then of course i'm doing star wars on the star wars report with riley blanton and the 602 Club's Christy Morris does a monthly Fashion and Five on there, so check that out. And of course, I'm on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex, and I'm always, always in the Babel Conference. John, uh, let everybody know where they can find you out there in this galaxy far, far away called social media. Well, gosh, send out a signal uh, coded to Kessel Junkie. Uh, I lurk on Twitter. You'll find me on Letterboxd, uh, sharing my views on movies and stuff. And you'll find me over as part of the Nerd Party, as part of two shows. One co-hosted with uh, Mike Schindler, no stranger to Trek FM, called Retro Perspective, where we are we're marching through 1994, one release week at a time. And boy, is it interesting. And you can also find me on a little show about Star Wars called Aggressive Negotiations with a charming host by the name of Matt Rushing. Matt, that happens to be you. Oh, I thought that was the other Matt Rushing, because he's more charming than I am. <laughs> Way more charming. How could you possibly be more charming than you, Matt? Come on. I, I mean, it's it's shocking. Is but he, you're, anyway, is you're he Matt Rushing no 01 <laughs> on Twitter, and you're Matt Rushing 02, uh, right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, yes, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Letterboxd, and Vero under the name Matt Rushing 02. Um, I am here on the network doing the orb with Chris Jones talking about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. We are looking forward to getting a chance to review uh, the documentary that just came out, um, what we left behind. So excited about that. So we will be doing that. Look for that. We'll get it out as soon as we can. Um, You can also find me on the uh, Nerd Party Network doing another show called Owlpost with Drea Kaufman. We are going through Harry Potter one chapter at a time. And in fact, we only have, as of this recording, we only have three episodes. episodes left in the order of the phoenix so it is crazy we're excited to be wrapping that up soon um and then uh, you can also find me over uh on the to be the church network doing a show called cinema stories and i do that with my good friend courtney and we talk about films through the lens of faith we want to say thank you so much for joining us and as always may the force be with you Thank you.